So last week we looked briefly at how to create threads in Java. So let's look at threads in a little more detail. So remember that in Java, we can create threads that can run in parallel by extending the class thread. And the way we do it is we extend the class thread and inside this we have a special function called run. So when we have something that extends thread and overrides this function run, then that function run can be actually executed in parallel. And the tricky thing is that to execute this function run in parallel, what you do is you call that function through start. So here is how you do it. So you have this class which extends parallel and in this particular case, what it does is it prints out. So it has an only one instance variable which is its, its ID and it just prints that out a hundred times. Okay? And in between it sleeps for one second, 1000 milliseconds. So this is what each object of type parallel does. So now this class at the bottom, this main function, it creates five such objects, right? It has an array of five such things. So it creates in PI, it creates a new parallel object whose ID is I and then it starts it, right? So the important thing is that it is start and not run. I can of course call PI.run, but if I do PI.run, it will not happen in parallel. It will be like a normal function call where it will wait for PI.run to execute and then come back. So if I do PI.run, then the zeroth process will print its ID 100 times, then process 1 will print it 100 times and so on sequentially. Whereas if I do PI.start, then I get this kind of an interleaved behavior where in some sequence the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, these 5 processes keep printing their ID and the order in which they print it keeps changing because it's the scheduling is kind of random. So we also said that because of this multiple inheritance problem or single inheritance problem, it's not enough to just have one class thread that you can extend. So we have to allow something more flexible. So Java has an runnable interface which has the same behavior. You define your class by implementing runnable instead of extending thread and everything else is the same. You have to override this function run. But the difference is that when you are using a runnable class rather than a thread extended subclass, you have to create the runnable objects and then you have to make threads out of them. So each PI has to be converted into a thread TI and you need to start the thread. You cannot start the runnable object directly. Right? So it is again start and not run, but it is start with respect to the thread which has been created with the runnable object. Right? So this is what we saw earlier. So a Java thread goes through a natural lifetime like a Java function would, like you call the function, it executes, it terminates. But in a Java thread, because it is occurring in parallel with other things, it is a little bit more uh, complicated the type of things that a Java thread could do. So initially, right, you have just created a thread, but you have not started it running. This Java thread is said to be in a new state. right? Now once you start it, then it is said to be in a runnable state. Now runnable does not mean running, running means it is currently executing. But remember that if you have say example only a single CPU, you could have many things potentially which are active and therefore they are runnable, but only one of them can be running at a time. Moreover Java does not promise you also in what order these things will be scheduled. right? So in general you will be doing it by allotting a certain amount of time per thread, then swapping it out, putting another one. So if you have even one resource only to compute on, you can have many threads running by each one executing for a small amount of time. But this is typically the case for you know desktops and big computers, but this may not be the case for instance if you are running Java on a phone. Java on a phone might actually execute a thread until it finishes before it executes another thread. So it really does depend on which Java implementation and which platform you are running it on. So there is no guarantee about how scheduling is done. So runnable is the situation where modulo the scheduler allowing it to run, the thread can run. But of course there are situations when a thread may not be able to run. So one situation is it is trying to execute something which is synchronized. It needs a lock, but that lock is already taken by another thread. So then it gets blocked right? and it must wait for that thread to release it. And then the scheduler will decide whether to wake up this thread or something else that is blocked. Right? So remember that in this blocked state, the thread itself is not doing any checking. It is not a busy wait. Right? It is just sleeping. 
It's the system which is keeping track of which threads are blocked on which locks. And when the lock gets released, it's the system, the underlying system, the operating system and the JVM's job to go and find the threads which are waiting on this lock and wake them up and then decide which one of them will run. So that is if you are waiting for a synchronized lock. On the other hand, a thread can suspend itself if you remember by saying wait, right? This is a condition variable wait. So then you are also blocked but in a different way. So now you are not waiting for a lock to be released but for some other thread to signal that this condition has now changed, right? So there is some update in the state which is through a notify or notify all. So you could be blocked or technically you can be waiting. So Java distinguishes these two states even though it does not distinguish the various kinds of runnable, running but not scheduled you cannot check but you can actually distinguish between blocked for a thread synchronization and waiting for a notify. And finally, we saw this sleep, right? We have sleep, we pass an argument which is interpreted as a length of time in milliseconds. So this is it also a kind of wait, the thread is, in, is suspended, it's not doing anything. But here the suspension lasts for a fixed amount of time. It's not based on some other event happening which it cannot predict, but it knows that after a certain amount of time, there will be a signal saying come and wake up. And finally, like any other function, eventually hopefully the thread will finish and then it goes into a dead state. Right? So we have six states, we have new, runnable, then these three versions of, of being blocked right? and one dead state. And there is actually a function in Java called get state which you can apply to a thread and find out which state it is in. So it will give you a, a kind of a enumerated variable which will be one of these six things. Not The wording is not exactly this but it will give you one of these six things. So this is the life cycle of a Java thread. It begins as a new thread, then it becomes runnable. While it is runnable, periodically it may block or it might wait or it might be in a timed wait and eventually it should end and it becomes dead. So you might want to send a signal to another thread that something interesting has happened or you might just want to tell another thread that it should stop running. Right? So an interrupt is like what you would expect in the world, you go and tap somebody on the shoulder and say excuse me, right? so they are busy watching something and you go and tap them on the shoulder and they interrupt them. So if I say give a thread and I say interrupt then it sends a signal to the other thread that it is being interrupted. Now the signal does not carry any information. Right? So it is up to the other thread to decide what to do with the signal, but the signal itself just is a signal, it is just somebody tapping you on your shoulder, you do not know who it is and why they are tapping. So if you are sitting inside that thread, how would you know this? Well, if the thread is inert, that is it is waiting or it is sleeping or even if it is blocked, then this signal will go as an exception, so you will get an interrupted exception. So that is the reason when we do a wait or a sleep, we have to do it in a try block checking this interrupted exception. But paradoxically, if it is running, if it is actually in a runnable state, then there is no interrupt exception. Then you actually have to check and this is some kind of a flag, you know, some kind of a signal flag. It is like somebody comes and pops up something on, on your object saying there is an interrupt, right? And now you have to go and look and see whether that flag is raised or not, right? So there is a function, so the interrupt function sets the flag and the, Inside the thread, you can say interrupted to check the flag. Right? So here is something that you might do if you want to catch both. Right? So if you want to try, you are waiting for an interrupt and you want to do something, then either you run and every time before the loop you check whether you have been interrupted or not. Right? And if it is potentially the case that in between you are inactive then you would also get an interrupt through the exception. So one way or the other you will catch it. If you only do the interrupted exception, you would not see this flag which was raised when you are running. And if you only do this running thing, then you would not catch the interrupted exception. And because it is a exception is thrown by sleep, if you do not catch this, then you must kind of advertise this outside your class saying that I throw interrupted exceptions. But in general, you have to do both, right? So you have to be able to check for an interruption when you are running by calling this function interrupted. And notice that what interrupted does is it checks the status and if the interrupt is there, if it is not there of course it will say false, if it is true then it will reset the interrupt. Right? So this means that the interrupt will have to be regenerated the next time so you will not see the same interrupt multiple times. 
right. So, that is one nice thing about this interrupted thing, it actually as you would expect it clears this interrupt flag, so that now somebody else can interrupt you later. Now, as, as I mentioned there is no guarantee as to what you should do with this interruption, right. So, you have to interpret and maybe you have to check something to understand why you have been interrupted. So, there is no information conveyed with this interrupt except that somebody has interrupted you, there is a signal. So, you can also check this interrupted flag right without clearing it, just find out whether something and not just your own flag, you can check for any thread right. You can check the interrupted flag by using a different function called is interrupted. So, is interrupted is different from the interrupted thing, interrupted checks whether it is interrupted and then clears the flag. Is interrupted checks whether there is, there is a pending interrupt, somebody has set the flag, but does not clear the flag. So, this is a if you want to think about a non-destructive examination of the interpreted status of another thread. Now, remember that we said that we there is no guarantee in general about how threads are scheduled, right. So, in a normal system like in a desktop or a laptop, a thread will run for some time and then automatically some other thread will run. So, the system will kind of guarantee that the resources are scheduled in such a way that no thread dominates. But it may be the case that you want a thread to give up its running status. So, it is like you want it to resign and say I will come back later, right. So, there is something called yield which gives up the active status to another thread. So, basically it is still runnable, it is not blocked, it is just saying give some time to somebody else to run, I will come back and run later, right. So, this is a static method in thread and this is used typically you do not use it very often in normal Java programming because the OS will actually guarantee that every thread yields periodically, it is no, no thread hogs the entire uh, resources. But when you are doing things on a mobile environment, it may be that the OS does not do it, allows a thread to run unless it yields. So, depending it really depends on the kind of application you are writing in Java whether you need to yield or not. The other thing that you might want to do, so here as we said you can investigate whether another thread has been interrupted, so you get some information about the other thread. But it is quite common when things start in parallel, right, so you start something and then you want to do some two or three things in parallel, so you start some threads and now each of these might want to wait for all the other threads to come and synchronize again. So, you might want to wait for all the threads that you have started in parallel to finish before proceeding, right. So, this you can do using a join, right, so you can wait for a thread to finish by saying t dot join. So, this will block the current thread until the thread t actually reaches the end of its execution, reaches a dead state. So, t has to terminate before this. So, join is a blocking thing which allows t to this thread to join with t in the sense that it waits for t to terminate, right. So, to summarize as we saw earlier, if you want to run something in parallel in Java, you must extend thread or implement runnable and if you implement runnable, you have to be careful to first take the runnable object and make a thread out of it, otherwise you cannot do the start, right. And start invokes run in parallel, so you do not directly call the run function, you have to implement the run function, override it, but what you do to create run in parallel is to actually say start. So, a thread once it starts, it is runnable. So, when you create it, it is new, when it starts it is runnable, but every runnable thread might go through a situation where it cannot run because it is blocked for various reasons, might be waiting for a lock, it have, might have suspended itself and is waiting for a notification or it might be waiting for some time to elapse through a sleep. And the other thing you can do is you can send a signal to another thread, so a thread must be able to receive the signal, so it can check its interrupted status or it can catch an interrupted exception. And finally, you can yield control by saying I want to stop running temporarily and let some other thread take over and you can also join with another thread which means you can specify that you want to wait until another thread is completed before you proceed. So, this is a block like you are saying that now I want all my con concurrent threads to again synchronize and proceed only after everything that is pending is finished.